Good morning, Crosspoint. How are you guys doing this morning? Y'all are away. Good to see you. Thanks for worshiping with us on this uh, three-day weekend. Uh, for those of you who are guests, wow, what a joy uh, to have you. I'm glad you're here. My name is Chan. I get the joy of serving as lead pastor here at Crosspoint. You guys ready to study the Bible? Yeah, all right. Grab your Bibles. Turn with me to Jonah chapter 2. That's where we're at this morning. If you don't have your smartphone or Bible with you, grab a Bible out of the chair in front of you, and you can find it there on page uh, 451. Now, um, while you're looking that up, let me just share with you where we're at in the book of Jonah. We're on week 2 uh, in a four-week journey through uh, this great Old Testament book. Now, some of you may be asking, why Jonah? Isn't it just something, a story about some dude that gets swallowed by a whale? Uh, what does it have to do with my life today? Now, let me answer that question for you because the book of Jonah has everything to do with our life today. The book of Jonah is all about grace and sin. Grace is God pursuing after his rebel children like you and me. And uh, sin is us running away from God's will and God's plan for our lives. And that's what this story is all about. It's all about God's relentless pursuit of sinners like you and me. And so everybody knows the story of Jonah. You don't even have to have read your Bible to know the story of Jonah. I mean, it's become part of our folklore. And I think one of the reasons we like the story of Jonah so much is not because it's a wild story about a dude getting swallowed by a whale, but it is about God's grace gone wild. Now, I know some of you have probably never heard or thought of God's grace in this way, but grace is the most transformational word in all of Scripture. Now, I use this language to jolt you from any unbiblical notion about what grace is. Like, grace is not something God gives to just good people, or grace isn't just winking at sin and letting sin slip by. Grace is not that at all. It is far wilder than that. Grace unsettles everything. Grace overflows the banks. Grace messes up the hair, as one author I read um, said this past week. Grace is not tame. Grace is wild. Now, do you grasp the depth and the power and the beauty of God's grace? Now, as we journey through the book of Jonah, I pray that you will see grace in a whole new way. I pray that grace will so captivate you in a wild, unexpected way that it would reorient the direction of your heart. Now, to the degree that you understand God's grace will be the degree that you're captivated by it, that it will shape your life. Now, listen to me. I think one of Satan's greatest tactics in robbing uh, us as believers, as followers of Christ, from experiencing the true power and riches of God's grace in our everyday lives is he uh, either distorts what God's grace is or distracts us from what God's grace. And what the book of Jonah does is bring God's grace uh, in all of its wildness to us in such a way that hopefully we won't miss it, that it'll be very clear to us. And so here's the question we want to wrestle with this morning. Uh, has God's, have you experienced God, the wildness of God's grace. Has God's grace gone wild in your life? Here's how you know if God's grace has gone wild in your life. Number one, it wrecks you. Number two, it rescues you. And number three, it renews you. So let's look at this at chapter two. I want to pick it up in the last verse of chapter one uh, to catch everybody up who may have missed last week. In verse 17, Chapter 1 ends with this verse, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of a fish three days and three nights. So how did we get here? How did we get to this part of the story? Well, if you rewind back to the beginning of chapter 1, God's word came to Jonah. Jonah was a prophet, and so God spoke to him, and he said, I want you to go declare my grace to the people of Nineveh. Now, that was the last thing Jonah wanted to do. Jonah did not want to preach God's grace to the evil, wicked people of Nineveh because 
they were Israel's enemy. And he thought they were not deserving of God's grace. And just even seeing that, you realize how unqualified Jonah is to preach the grace of God to the people of Nineveh because the grace of God has been lost on his own heart. He thought he was better than the Ninevites. And so he was self-righteous. He was racist towards them. And it's because of his heart was in this condition. He ran as far as he could get, not only from Nineveh, but for God's will in his life. And he went to the opposite end of the known world uh, in a ship to Tarsus, which is in Spain, which is about as far as you could get in the known world at that time. He was running from God, but God ran after him and sent a storm to where the sailors said, what is the cause of this storm? And Jonah says, it's me. I'm running from God. Throw me overboard. And sure enough, they threw him overboard. And in the midst of a raging sea, we see that God sends a big fish to swallow Jonah. So that's where we're at. And so verse 1, chapter 2, then in the midst of the belly of a fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. This is a cry for deliverance saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the hearts of the sea, and the flood surrounded me, and your waves and your billows passed over me. And then I said, I'm driven away from your sight, yet I shall look uh, upon your holy temple. The waters closed over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I was suffocating. I was overwhelmed. I was in distress, Jonah cries out. And I was at the bottom. It says, at the root, in verse 6, of the mountains. I went down to the land. I was as deep as deep could be in this pit of darkness. And the bars closed upon me forever. You brought me up, you, yet, yet you. Brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your temple. Those who pray regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will pay, salvation belongs to the Lord. And then this is how chapter 2 ends. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Now, here's the first thing I want you to see about the wildness of God's grace is that, is the, is that God's grace will wreck you. I mean, it brings you to the end of yourself. It brings you into a deep, utter dependence upon God. The first chapter ends with Jonah being swallowed by a big fish. Look at it with me again. It says, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. Notice that Jonah tells us that the Lord appointed a great fish. I don't want you to miss this very important truth. It is this, God's grace sends the storms into your life. Now, you may have never thought about grace in this way, but this is how wild grace really is. It's God's grace, the storms you encounter in your life, is a means of God's grace to work in your life. Like, look at Jonah exposes this truth in his prayer for deliverance. Look at verse 3. It says, For you cast me into the deep, into the hearts of the sea, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Notice that who is, who is Jonah giving credit for the storms? Who is Jonah giving credit to sinking him to the depths of the sea? It is God, God's grace towards Jonah. Now, inevitably in life, you're going to go through storms. I mean, if you've lived for any amount of time, you've experienced struggle and hardship. You've experienced uh, 
the circumstances of life becoming chaotic around you, and you're realizing, I'm not in control of any of this. And yet, here in the book of Jonah, what Jonah wants us to see is that uh, the storms of life are a means of God's grace. And if you want to experience the pulsating power, the beauty, the riches of God's grace, then you must begin to see your storms, the chaos of your circumstances, as a means of God's grace to bring you to the end of yourself so that you will be desperately dependent upon him. Now, if you refuse to see it as a means of God's grace, here's what's going to happen. You are going to spend your whole life running from storm to storm to storm to storm, never tasting of the riches and the sweetness of God's grace until you embrace the truth that the wildness of God's grace is that he actually is the author of the storms that come your way. Now, God wrecking you is a means of bringing you to the end of yourself so that you'll be radically and completely dependent upon him. I mean, this is the means by which you become a Christian. You have to see this if you're ever going to experience the grace of salvation. Grace wrecks us in wildly unexpected ways. I mean, it really is going to wreck you. And that's okay because we need to be wrecked. We need, no, nothing is more difficult to get our minds around than the unconditional wrecking means of God's grace. I mean, here's how grace wrecks you. It wrecks you because it exposes the true condition of our souls before we experience His grace. There is nothing whatever in uh, it that gratifies the pride of man. God, God's grace just wars against our pride, wars against our self-righteousness. I mean, this is why Jonah was running, because he was self-righteous. And what God is trying to do to Jonah is bring him to the ends of his self-righteousness. Because it's his self-righteousness is that sinking him into the depths, and God's storms allow that to happen to bring him to the end of his self. Now, grace announces that unless we are saved by grace, we cannot be saved at all. It declares that apart from Christ, apart from the unspeakable riches of God's grace, the state of every man is uh, desperate and hopeless. This is where Jonah was at. Now, Jonah, in a sense, was dead. He was buried in the belly of a well. And from Jonah's perspective, there's no hope of resurrection life. He was beyond saving himself. And God's grace exposes that in his heart. God's grace exposes that same truth in our heart in the storms and the chaos of life. And quite honestly, that offends us. It offends us that, um, that God's grace deals with us as men and women who are guilty and condemned and perishing criminals. It declares that the most chaste moralist is in the same terrible plight as the most promiscuous pagan. And the religious, with all their performance, is no better off than the most profane sinner. The Pharisee is no better off than the prostitute. Now, grace will require you to face your unworthiness before a holy God without ever feeling unloved. Because grace simultaneously shows us how deeply sinful we are and in desperate need of a Savior, and yet grace simultaneously gives us that Savior and shows us how deeply loved we are. That all comes together at the cross. And so grace offends us because we can't earn it. It's unconditional. Here's our problem. Even believers struggle with this notion of grace being unconditional because we live in a culture, we live in a society that conditions us against unconditionality, right? Right? 
track with me, let that sink in. We live in a culture, we live in a society that conditions us against unconditionality. We are told in a thousand different ways, accomplishments precedes acceptance. Achievement precedes approval. And so society demands this two-way love. Everything's conditional. If you achieve and only then will you receive meaning and security and respect and love and on and on and on. But it's all based upon us achieving, whereas God's grace is despite our achievements. It is based upon what Jesus achieved for us on the cross. And so grace is a one-way love. Grace is a love that seeks you out when you have nothing to offer or give in return. That's the story of Jonah. Grace is coming at you because of nothing that you have done to deserve it. This is the story of Jonah. Grace is being loved when you're unlovable. This is the story of Jonah. This can be your story as you experience the wildness of God's grace. Now, grace is radically unbalanced. It has no but. It is unconditional, uncontrollable, unpredictable, undomesticated. It is wild. And it is in despair at the bottom of an overwhelming, suffocating ocean when his life was fainting away that Jonah, that his life was being wrecked, that he experienced a grace that rescued grace wrecks, then it rescues. Look at me with me at verse 6. It says, at the root of the mountain, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Like, it was hopeless. He was dead. And it is in that moment when he was at the bottom, when he was in his greatest despair, when he had lost all hope, He says, yet you, yet God, brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. You see, it is in the pit that Jonah experienced God's saving, rescuing grace. When Jonah is his his deepest despair, he experiences yet God. The two greatest words a lost person, a person dead in their sins can hear are these two words found in verse 6, yet God. I don't know what your circumstances are this morning. I don't know how deep in despair you are. I don't know how far you have sunk just emotionally in your hopelessness and depression and despair. But here's two words that will infuse deep hope into any circumstances you're facing this morning. And here they are, yet God. Overwhelmed, yet God. Depressed, yet God. Despairing, yet God. Despite our being dead in sin, God rescues us. I want you to see this clearly this morning. Grace rescues. Jonah called out for God for deliverance, and he delivered. Look again at verse 1. It says, then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of a fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, I have cried, and what happened? God heard my voice. You see, grace is wildly scandalous. It gives salvation to the undeserving. Grace rescues us from sin and death. Not because of anything we can offer, but but out of God's sheer richness of mercy and because of his great love, which he has loved us even while we were yet undeserving sinners. Now, here's what I want you to see. Jonah deserved death. Because the penalty of sin is death. What he deserved for running from God was to die in the belly of a well, right? Now, we see that the penalty of sin is death. We see the evidence of that everywhere in life. When a wrong is committed, death comes. 
When a relationship is wrong, death comes to that relationship. We are walking dead. We are zombies apart from Christ. Now, prior to our salvation, although we are physically alive, we are spiritually dead, incapable of life with God. Our lack of holiness rendered us incapable of a living relationship with a holy God. Now, let, let, me, let, me, let me show you the desperation, desperation of your situation apart from God. You are dead beyond rescuing yourself. Imagine this. Imagine uh, fast forwarding to the Gospels where uh, the story of Lazarus uh, takes place. Imagine being present at the time when Jesus approached the tomb of Lazarus. Now, none of us on that day would have approached the one that was dead and said, Hey, Lazarus, Lazarus, you need to get up because Jesus is here to help you. Lazarus, come on now. He's a really wonderful Savior. All you need to do is reach out to him and he will save you. Come on, Lazarus. If you'll just take the first step, he'll do the rest. Now, that's a gospel many of us grew up with, but the wildness of God's grace tramples on that. We wouldn't say any of those things. Why? Because we knew Lazarus was dead, and there was nothing he could do in and of himself to resurrect himself, to rescue himself. But when Jesus comes and said, Lazarus, come forth, he responded. Now, do we say he responded because of any initiative or effort on his own? No, he was dead. Lazarus responded because Jesus gave him the ears to hear, the strength to move, the breath to live, and the will to obey. Lazarus responded, but Jesus was responsible for the new life because Lazarus was dead. Now, Jesus alone raised Lazarus. He alone is the life giver because Lazarus was dead and totally unable to do anything for himself. And since we are spiritually dead prior to God giving us new life, the spiritual life we have must be by his grace and for his glory alone. Now, this is true of Jonah as it was of Lazarus. And it is also true of us. We must come to see this truth if we want to experience the wildness of God's rescuing grace. So it is a work of grace that brings us into new life. It is grace that justifies. Nothing in and of ourselves make us acceptable to God. He pours out his saving grace upon us in an unconditional way upon undeserving sinners like you and me. It's grace upon grace, period. He rescues us, not because we deserve it, but because of his sheer, nothing but his grace. Now, here's the question I really want us to wrestle with this morning. Why is it that we don't experience daily the pulsating power of God's rescuing grace? Why don't we experience grace amidst the chaos? Why don't we experience God's grace in the midst of the storms of life? And I think this is a question that if you're going to seriously follow after Jesus, if you seriously want to experience the wildness of God's grace, you have to come to an answer to this. Why not? Well, Jonah gives us the answer in verse 8. L look at it with me. He goes, those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. Now, um, the NIV translates it this way. It says, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Now, here's what Jonah is saying. We need to be rescued from, what well, we need to be rescued from the most or the false saviors we turn to in times of distress. It, it, here's what God's grace is. He's rescuing us from lesser things that we put our hope, our security, and our identity in. Now, here's what I want you to see. Identity, idolatry is a major theme throughout Scripture. If you've been around here for any length of time, you will have had to have heard me preach against idolatry. Now, why am I always bringing up idolatry? Because it is hard to read 
any book of the Bible or even turn to uh, turn too many pages of Scripture before Scripture confronts us of idolatry. Um, John Calvin famously said this, man's nature, so to speak, is a perpetual factory of idols. In other words, our hearts are idol factories. We, we, uh, we uh, love to pursue after lesser things, after false gods or God substitutes. Now, here's why. You can't eliminate God. You can't run from God without replacing him with God's substitutes. Now, idolatry is finding your identity and value and worth in what you have or what you've accomplished um, versus in who Jesus is and what he has accomplished for us on the cross. And so we make good things, ordinarily good things, ultimate things or God things. Now, up front, idols promise you life and life to its fullest. Here's the problem. In the end, idols will always sink you. They will always require of you to sacrifice everything. Like, that's what Jonah's done here. He has run from God in his self-righteousness and sought refuge in something created, a boat in the middle of an ocean that God created and God controls. How foolish is that, right? And yet every single one of us put our trust in created things in boats in a universe that God holds in the hollow of his hand. And every one of those created things will sink you. And here's the problem. We often don't see how futile our pursuit of idols are until we're overwhelmed by life because our idols have failed us. And then think about it with me. Most of our distress comes from putting our trust in created things rather than the Creator. This is often why we have anxiety and stress and fear. Our souls are screaming out to us that we have put our hope, our security, our identity in lesser things and fleeting things in things that will fail us. Now, at the pit of his despair, at the rock bottom, Jonah comes to this conclusion in verse 8. He's saying, created things can't love us like our Creator can. Idols can't love us with a steadfast love. When we turn to them, sure, they can make us feel good up front, initially. But because they are created things, they are temporal things, they are fleeting things, they are perishing things, they will eventually fail us. They will sink us. Now, only God through Jesus Christ can promise us steadfast love. Only, only God can give us that. Why is that? Because God's love for us is rooted not in what we do, but in what Christ has done, in his perfection, not our, uh, in our imperfection. It's rooted in grace. God's love for us is not dependent upon us but dependent upon his son, Jesus Christ. God is eternal, so he is going to love us with an everlasting love. He will never fail us. Now, Jonah is telling us that if you are clinging to something for your security or for your comfort, and if it's not Jesus, it will actually sink you down further and further. And yet, letting go is terrifying. When we pursue after anything as ultimate other than God, we are idol chasing. Now, here's where God's grace comes in. Jesus loves you enough to strip you of those functional saviors that you have cling to rather than him because he loves you. He's a jealous God. He wants you for himself. Not because he's self, some self-centered God and needs you at all, but because he loves you and knows that you need him most of all. Now, what happens when Jesus lovingly begins to strip you of your idols? It feels like all the nerves are being ripped apart. 
All the fears and insecurities are exposed with the uprooting of your false saviors. It will feel like you're under spiritual attack, but really you're under spiritual surgery to remove the idols that have deeply been deeply rooted in your heart. Now, here's what I want to say to you as your pastor. Don't resist the loving hand of God's discipline in your life. Don't resist the storms. Don't resist the storms. Take comfort in it. It is evidence that you truly are a child of God. Never confuse the hand of God with the hand of Satan. Satan will never try to remove your idols from you. He is perfectly content letting you trust in lesser things than God. And so see the hand of God versus the hand of Satan. Here's what Jonah's trying to say. He says, you cannot wrap your hands around an idol and simultaneously be open-handed towards God's grace. Jonah comes to realize this at a very dark place in his life that everything else pales in comparison to God and his grace. So some of you are here this morning, you realize that you've never experienced God's rescuing grace. You have clung to and pursued after everything but God to lesser things. And so here's where your opportunity here at a new year begins, that you get to experience God's rescuing grace. It is simply a gift to be received through faith by a work of God's grace in your heart. In trusting him, not other things or other people, but trusting him to be your ultimate rescuer. But here's the kicker. You have to let go of all the false saviors in order to receive his grace. That's what Jonah is telling us. That, that's, what, um, that's what this verse is telling us. That, um, that um, the, it, it, whoop, let me go back to the NRV. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. And so the way you receive Christ is to, you got to repent of those idols. Now, you may be here, and your life in some way and somehow is a wreck. <laughs> you're, you are being wrecked. I mean, that may be why you're here now. Your idols have been threatened, and you have run to the church and run to Jesus to rescue you, to rescue those idols that are sinking you. And Jesus, listen to me, the wildness of God's grace is Jesus is not going to rescue your idols until you let go of them and cling to him and to him alone. Now, I'm not saying he's going to get rid of your idols. He's just going to help you see that they're just gifts that help you realize how good the gift giver is, right? And that you'll cling to the gift giver and not the gifts. That's ridiculous. Now, you may be here, and you may be wrecked emotionally. You may be wrecked financially. You may be wrecked relationally. You may be struggling in a relationship with a boyfriend or girlfriend. You may be struggling in a marriage. You may be struggling in a relationship with a child or a work relationship. Uh, and you feel like your whole life is a wreck. Your dreams that you've had for your life have failed you. It may be that God's grace is bringing you to the end of yourself so you could see your need of an ultimate rescuer not just to save you from your circumstances, but to save you from your sin, from looking to other things to be your Savior rather than Christ. Jesus wants to save you from your idols. For others of you that are sitting here, things are going really, really well. I meant you seem to have everything you need in your life. You seem like You've achieved all of your dreams, and yet, deep down inside, you feel like something's missing. You got it all, and now that you have it all, you still have that achingness in your soul, and you all know what? It's wrecking you. It's wrecking you. That is God's grace. Salvation by grace seems simple, but it's actually hard because it requires you to humbly come empty-handed to God. We earn nothing, 
Jesus earns it all. We boast in nothing. Jesus gets all the boasting. We don't save ourselves. Jesus alone saves. Now, our response to the chaos ought to be calling out to God. Finally, Jonah is is doing this. This is what we see in verse 1. Then Jonah cried out. He prayed to the Lord. Now, let me ask you, are you calling out? Now, some of you are afraid to call out because God may actually answer. It's kind of like in junior high, uh, for anybody 30 and under, you're just going to have to trust me on this. Uh, Before caller ID, in middle school, you would call up that girl, right? And as soon as she answered, you'd boom, you'd hang up. Why would you hang up? Because you feared that she may reject you, that her answer may be no. But here's the beauty of God's grace. When you call out, he always answers. He always answers. Now, um, I want to stop right here, right now for a moment. For some of you, your life is a wreck because everything is in chaos. Or your life's in a wreck because everything is great and you're still missing something. It's God's grace pursuing after you. And so I want to stop right here before we wrap up this message. I'm not done yet, but I want us to pray. Will everyone bow their heads and close their eyes? Without a doubt, some of you are being wrecked. And it's because you've either never experienced, I think for all of us, We need to realize it's God's grace that's wrecking us. But for some of us, we've never experienced God's rescuing grace. Or for some of us, we have forgot. We have lost sight of his rescuing grace. In our desperate dependence upon him, and we've clinged to other things. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to call out just like Jonah did. I want you to pray to the Lord, and he will answer you. So you can say something like this. Say, Jesus, forgive me for looking to everywhere else and to everyone else to be my ultimate rescuer. I know now that you are wrecking my life so I can see you as my ultimate rescuer. And so Jesus, by your grace, I put my faith in you and you alone as my Savior, my Lord, my ultimate rescuer. By your grace alone, I receive that. Now, if you've just prayed this prayer, we know from the story of Jonah that God will answer. God will answer. He will save you. He will rescue you. Now, you can rest. Okay, look up with me for a moment. If you've prayed that prayer, I want you to let me know on that connect card, all right? But here's the last thing I want you to know about the wildness of God's grace is that grace renews. Grace renews. The moment you receive the grace for the very first time, you begin to change from the inside out. It renews you. It radically reorients your focus and drive in life. Now, how do you know you've experienced rescuing grace? Because you'll experience the power of renewing grace. This is the question every one of us have to answer with. How do we know we've experienced rescuing grace? Well, Jonah answers this question for us in verse 9. Look at it with me. He goes, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. I will pay what I owe. I will, I, what I have vowed, I will pay. And then he says this, salvation belongs to the Lord. Now, if I were you, I did this. I would underline that phrase. Because salvation belongs to the Lord is not only a theme of the book of Jonah, it is the theme of all of Scripture. The, um, Jonah is describing a life captivated by grace, living a life of obedience, absolute surrender to God. Jonah has realized how far sin has taken him and how far God would re- pursue him in rescuing him. And his only response to that is gratitude. We say this all the time. The vertical response to the gospel is gratitude. Everything I am and everything I have belongs to you. Now, the fear of teaching grace is that we'll enable sinful behavior. But listen to me. The one who is truly gripped by grace is radically reoriented towards holiness. 
Here's why Jonah could say this. With a voice of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you. Here's why he could say that. I want you to see that Jonah hasn't been rescued from the well yet. He hasn't been freed from his circumstances yet. Verse 10 hasn't occurred yet. He hasn't been puked up on the beach yet. And yet he says, with the voice of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you. He can say this because he knows this truth about his salvation and our salvation. That salvation belongs to the Lord. The work of salvation belongs to God from beginning to end. That is what salvation of grace is. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. We didn't work for it. Salvation is a work of God from beginning to end. Now, in understanding the wildness of God's grace in that way, it has huge implications to our everyday life. Now, track with me why that's true. If I was saved by my good works, then there'd be a limit to what God could ask of me or put me through. In a sense, I would be a taxpayer with rights because I paid a little, God gave me a little, uh, He owes me a certain quality of life if I had a part of my salvation, if salvation only partly belonged to the Lord and partly belonged to me. But if I am a sinner saved by grace, then there is nothing that God can ask of me. If I'm a sinner saved by grace, if anything, I am more subject to the sovereign lordship of God. We come to know that if Jesus really has done all of this for us, we would not be our own. We would joyfully and gratefully belong to Jesus who provided for all of this at an infinite cost to himself. Now, the most liberating act of free, unconditional grace demands that the recipient give up control of his life. Now, how could grace demand? Is this not a contradiction? No, because we are not in control of our lives. We're all living for something, and we are all controlled by that. Whatever that something is, is the true Lord of our lives. The problem many of us have is we think that is, uh, we have is the thing we are living for, the thing we are clinging to, is sinking us and keeping us from experiencing the grace of God. It causes us to forfeit the grace of God. Now, Jesus has a uh, full right to lay claim to your life because he has given himself at such an infinite cost so that you and I, undeserving sinners, could be completely and eternally free. Now, here's what I want you to see on this. The purpose of God's rescuing grace is so that you can experience God's renewing grace. Grace is too wild to let us stay in love with the unrighteous life we once had, the one we lived before experiencing God's rescuing grace. Grace is too freeing to leave you in the slavery of sin. It's too untamed to let the lust of the hearts go unconquered. It demands us to let go of the idols we cling to and cling to something greater than ourselves, something that can love us with a steadfast, everlasting love. Now, grace's power is too uninhibited to not unleash us for the happiness of a holy life. Now, Isaac Watts, in his famous hymn, Oh, the Wondrous Cross, writes this. He goes, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Now, he's saying, when I look at the wildness of God's grace in Christ Jesus and the infinite cost he paid so that I could be rescued, by his grace, the only response to that is this. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Now, you know you've experienced rescuing and renewing grace because this song becomes your soul's song. You sing it every single day. Love so amazing, so divine. Demands my soul, my life, my all. Now, 
That's what God wants for us. That's the story of Jonah. But this is how it ends, right? We got to end it. And the Lord God, the Lord spoke to the fish and it moved Jonah out upon the dry land. Right? That's the Greek word for vomit, right? Jonah's passage through death and coming out alive is an image of the foreshadowing of uh, Christ's ultimate victory over the grave when he raised himself from the dead. Something Jonah couldn't do himself, Jesus did. The only reason we can experience wrecking grace and rescuing grace and renewing grace is because Jesus rose from the dead, conquering the three-headed dragon of Satan, sin, and death for us. Now, here's the problem most of us face, is we tend to forget about God's amazing grace. We tend to start relying on our own unlimited and exhaustible strength rather than God's unlimited, inexhaustible grace. We begin to strive rather than abide in grace. The greatest danger of wandering from the foot of the cross is when things are going well. We forget what Jesus did for us on the cross. And so Christ knew our propensity to forget that which is of most importance, and so he instituted communion. When he instituted the Lord's Supper, he told us, every time you partake, do this in remembrance of me. Remember how wild my grace is. And live in the beauty and the power and the riches of it every single day by being surrendered to it, to a grace that demands everything, demands your life, our all. Will you stand with me? This morning, we're going to take communion and remember how wild God's grace is through what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Jesus, we thank you. Forgive us to clinging to lesser things, to idols that forfeit us experiencing the power of your grace every single day. Oh, Holy Spirit, lift our eyes from you to you. For many of us, our lives are a wreck and we are in the pet. We are overwhelmed and more than anything, we need to call out to you and experience your rescuing grace. And so Jesus, May we experience your grace to repent of those false saviors and cling to you as our one true savior. The one who paid an infinite price in pursuit of undeserving sinners like us. Oh, Holy Spirit, may that rush into our hearts and minds this morning like a waterfall. And may our response to be to that love so amazing, so divine, that we may say, God, I give you my all, my soul, my life, my all.